probably don't be surprised what the lesson is on today, what we're talking about. Christmas, birth of Jesus. And I wanted to start out by asking about traditions, the traditions that we have for Christmas. And I'm really curious to know your opinion on, and not just our personal ones, but like as a culture, this country. Which, which of our traditions honor the true meaning of the season? And what are some things that we do that really have nothing to do with the real meaning? Rob? I like the tradition of uh, giving gifts. Okay, giving gifts. Honor the greatest gift ever of the Lord. Amen. Is, uh, God with us. Amen. You think gift giving is in keeping with the, the meaning of the season? What else? What are some traditions we have? What's one that really is very Christian? Santa. Santa. Okay, there we go. That's, that's the obvious one. Santa. I was complaining to my kids this week. I don't know where we were. Somewhere in public. And Christmas music was playing, but it was all secular. And it's, that's just one of my pet peeves. I really don't like secular Christmas music. It gets on my nerves for Christmas. I don't like it. Anything else? Any traditions you can think of? I think expressions of love and care okay. go out to people more. Expressions of love and care? People do seem to try to be nice at this time of year. Sam? We have a a family tradition of pot roast and noodles on Christmas Eve. And um, it, the only reason it became a tradition is because I'm very limited in my culinary skills. <laughs> and I was always responsible for Christmas Eve dinner. And it's the only thing I knew how to cook. So now my daughter cooks it. My son over in Sweden's having it for Christmas Eve. That's cool. That's cool. Cool tradition. Probably unique to your family and your family. Uh, yeah, well. very unique. Well, tonight we want to walk, or walk through some of the probably more well-known verses about Christmas and a few of them that maybe are not so well-known when we come to think of Christmas. And um, the theme for the whole lesson tonight is how can we keep the emphasis on the right thing? Or how can we keep the main thing the main thing when it comes to, uh, when it comes to Christmas? And so um, if somebody wants to read for me, we're going to start out in Luke. Luke chapter 2. Verses 13 and 14. And I'll take any translation, but for this one, I would really appreciate the King James. If anyone has that. But if not, first one ready, just go for it. Savior has appeared. 
I um, so in my ranting to my kids the other day about the secular music, um, I got into talking about Christmas and I said, Great, really, Christmas is accurately, if you think of it from a biblical perspective, a very non sentiment sentimental holiday. It's not very sentimental. Um, the message of Christmas, really to even accept it, is pretty humbling. Like Ross said, it's about salvation for my soul. The whole point of Christmas is that this world is so messed up, so infiltrated with sin, that God had to come down here and break into it to, to save you and me. That's the point of Christmas. And of course, we've gotten really far away from celebrating it that way. But when we do celebrate it that way, with the humility that is required to say, I needed you to come and save me, it brings out what Luke says here in this verse. He says, on earth, peace. Peace and goodwill toward men. Battery thin. Battery thin. So I'd like to ask, and if you want to share publicly, that's fine, but regardless, I want you to be thinking. If Jesus came down here to bring peace, I think Christmas is a good time for us to stop and deliberately ask ourselves, where do I most need peace in my life? And secondly, where might I be able to be an agent of peace for people around me? That might be more a personal question. If you don't feel like sharing here, that's fine. But where do I most need peace? And how can I be an agent of peace, that goodwill toward my fellow man to those around me? Yeah. Real fast. Is your mic on? No, it's not. <laughs> Thank you. That would be the problem. Can you hear me now? Could you hear me before? <laughs> we can hear you pretty well. It's just kind of off of this up here. Okay. Sorry about that. So when the Bible talks about peace, there's three different kinds of peace that, that the Bible talks about. Peace with God, peace of God, and then peace with each other. The peace, having peace with God, having the peace of God, and then having peace with each other. Anybody want to explain those three, or at least one of them? Of, with, or with each other? Because they're three very different things. Jesus came to bring all three. Well, the peace of God is you're, you're, you're safe. You're... Okay. I would say the peace of God, or down here, is that you're you're at peace with yourself. You're saved, and that brings you comfort. I would say the first one, peace with God, is what takes care of my sin debt. Right? Until that's taken care of, then I'm technically at war with God. I'm his enemy. The Bible's very clear about that. So that has to be dealt with first. But once it does, once it's dealt with, then I can have the peace of God inside of me. And I hopefully find that as a Christian, I worry less than someone who's a non-believer. I hope that's true. It should, it should be. It, it, in theory, it very well should be. That if you take someone who's at a similar life stage as me, or, or you, but yet they don't have peace with God and the peace of God in their heart, they're going to spend a whole lot more time worrying than I am or than you are. If that's not the case... Well, we need to address that. Not to give you one more thing to worry about, but we need to, we need to, we need to address that. But. All right, so let me ask about that. Before we move on, we're going to talk about some other things with Christmas. When we say peace and joy, what does that mean to you? I think expectation management really helps here. If Luke said that Jesus came to bring peace on earth and goodwill toward men, what, what exactly does that mean? If I talk about having the peace of God inside of me, or you have it, what, what, what should you expect? What's it feel like? Yeah. Amen. Until my enemy status with God is rectified, then logically I should be afraid. 
I should have fear. Ross? I was just thinking that it's that Jesus came to bring peace, but I've been reading all year through the New Testament and I'm now finishing up in Revelation. And it talks a lot about the wrath of God against his enemy, our enemy, the, the evil one, and those who reject the gift of Jesus. So he came to bring peace and joy, but for those who reject his gift, it's the opposite. Yeah, it absolutely is. For those who reject his gift, it's the opposite. Yeah, Jesus is the absolute worst enemy you would ever want to have. I mean, and especially when you get to Revelation, there's a lot of blood in that chapter, or that book. Um, William has commented, the Bible's kind of R-rated. The Bible's very R-rated, very, very much so, absolutely. Yeah, Revelation is, it's a gruesome book. Yeah. Like, he did say that. He did say that. Yeah, if, you, if we're true followers of Jesus, we're not going to have peace with the world. Uh, amen. I, I read earlier somewhere today, I don't remember where I read it, but um, it was talking about there being no room at the inn. And it said, if we're real followers of Jesus, there's always going to be places where we're not welcome at the table. Um, and we should expect that. Um, we, we should expect it. Yeah. So this is a good point. So Jesus, we're talking about having peace of God and peace with God and goodwill towards men. But Jesus was very clear. He also came to bring a sword, and there's a lot of destruction coming later in the book. We've read the end, so we, we're okay with it. You know, we, know, we know which side that we're on. But, um, so that gets back to, as we're driving home today, or we're celebrating Christmas tomorrow or the next day, how should our hearts be different than, well, someone who's celebrating Christmas but not for the right reason? Ross? One of the things I struggle with is to look at non-believers as God does. I'm not good at that yet. Hmm. I don't see people and think immediately my first thought would be that person needs to hear the gospel. You know, it's, it's not automatic for me yet. Appreciate that. Ross said he struggles to see non-believers, especially the way that God sees them. Um, appreciate you being honest. I think if we're honest, a lot of us can say that we have that sentiment, especially with certain people. I mean, everybody rubs us the wrong way, but I appreciate that. So I just want to stick, because we've got to move on. Um, but the way I like to think of peace, for an expectation management thing, so I don't get myself further disappointed down the road, is... Of course, peace and happy are not the same thing, right? H happy sometimes is pretty synthetic. You just paint on a good face like the sad clown and happy, either it's fake or it's situational. Anybody can be happy when they're having a good day. But joy is entirely different. And the best way I've ever heard joy explained is it's kind of like the ballast of a ship that goes deep down below the ship and it keeps it upright when the waves and the storm really start crashing against it. It allows the, the boat not to fully capsize. That's joy. At least that's the best way I've ever heard joy explained. If you have a better way, I'd like to hear, you know, pull me aside afterwards and let me know. Um, but I want to look now at the virgin birth, the virgin birth and then the wise men, as how can those two stories bring us that kind of peace throughout the rest of our life? How can those two stories make us different than your average non-believer? So, um, Virgin birth. Actually, we don't need to, to read it. Um, anybody, anybody at the story of the virgin birth? You want to read it? I kind of would rather keep the conversation going. We'll do it. Okay. Do Actually, let's do the wise men first. Huh? The wise men first. Look, uh, Matthew 2. Matthew chapter 2. Matthew 2. I, I want to read the first three verses. Then 
Matthew chapter 2, starting verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi came from, from the east, came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. All right. So, first verse, Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, is all that we know about the wise men. They became pretty famous over the years, and they're in every nativity scene ever. Although my kids always get upset if they're right up at the nativity scene. They, they point out that it's not theologically accurate. And so we have them at our house, but they're on the other side of the room. Just to, make this, just to make it accurate. And good preachers, kids. They've you know, they got to get it right. But um, that, that verse is all we know about these guys. Verse, that's all we know about. And the Bible doesn't tell us anything else. Um, except maybe their intent, which is in verse 2. And they ask a question in verse 2 that is, well, one, it's the first recorded question in the New Testament. But I would say, more importantly... It's the most important one. This question that they ask is another variation of the most important question that each of us will ever ask of ourselves. And I would say it's one that we're never really done answering. Where is the king? Where's the king? Now we'll get back to why that's so important. But verse 3, uh, Ross read what's probably the most understated verse in the entire Bible. King Herod was deeply disturbed. Kind of hard to overstate how disturbed Herod was, but um, he was deeply disturbed. Now, why was that? Let's kind of break that down for a minute. Ross? He thought his power was threatened as king. He thought his power was threatened as king. Yeah. And if we're being fair and objective here, that question is going to be pretty alarming to anybody who's currently sitting on a throne. Right? I mean, in the same way that if someone were to come into Ross's house and ask Ross, hey, where's the head of the household? That would be a little offensive. So to be fair with Herod for just a minute, and we don't need to be fair with him for very long, that's a pretty, that's a pretty disturbing question. Now, why do I think that it's the most important question in the New Testament, or really in the world? Why is this question so important? Scott? Uh, if we settle that question, that settles a lot of other issues in our life. If we get that question answered correctly, Jesus is the king, and that uh, makes life Absolutely. If we actually settle this question, it makes the rest of our life much more livable. And really, we said earlier, we should probably be living in fear until we have this resolved. But if we actually resolve it, it helps take care of so many things moving forward. Of course, it doesn't take our problems away entirely, but it does help <coughs> take care of quite a few things. Why do you think this is so hard to settle, though? I think it's deceptive because... This is one of those things that we can think, well, I was baptized when I was 15. I settled that 25 years ago. Kind of. I saw a hand back here. Because we're still sitting on our own throne. Amen. Amen. And it's hard to give that up. We're still sitting on our own thrones. And it's, it's hard to give that up. If, if I can just be a little bit blunt here. Well, the Bible's the one saying it, not me. Is it fair to say that all of us have a little King Herod inside of us? Each, each and every one of us does? Now, of course, we don't go to the extreme that King Herod does here, but we were discussing this the other day, me and the kids, and I said, now, clearly, he was a sociopath. Herod was one of the worst men to ever live. We need to say that out loud. He was an awful human being. But to spend too much time saying that is to take the focus off of my own ability to do bad. I've got a, a great capacity to do a lot of bad. Ross? Well, and we have. We're, we killed Jesus. Amen. He died for our sin. So, 
whenever somebody uses the word deserve, I say, I don't like to think about that word because I deserve to go to hell. Mm. And yet, God has saved me from that situation. Amen. Amen. We don't think about a lot of times about Jesus as king of my life. I mean, we say that. But, but we don't really think about what that means. And so we have a thing, uh, one of our traditions every year for Christmas is um, 25 days. It starts in de- December 1st. Mm-hmm. So we have an Advent thing we do from one December until Christmas. And it's a different uh, title of Jesus every night. Um, and we pull it out and, and talk about what that is every, every night. And then it's a different title the next night. And um, I had to explain to some of the, our younger kids the difference between Messiah and Lord. Because they are not the same thing. They are not the same thing. Which one do you think is more difficult for us to accept? Mm-hmm. Lord. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's pretty humbling to accept the Messiah part at first. Right? It's admitting that I need one. It's kind of like, I mean, I think of this every Christmas to try and keep my mind in the right place. Let's, let's say Hannah bought me a, a book on weight loss and wrapped it up and put it underneath the tree. And with the best of intentions, like she, my wife loves me and wants what's best for me. But to, to accept that gift would be pretty humbling because I would first have to admit what? I need to lose the weight. Christmas is the same way. It's the same way. And we need to have that humility every Christmas morning, reminding ourselves, hey, unwrapping these gifts really points to something much, much bigger. And my prayer is that it keeps me humble. Because I know I have a, a tendency to let Herod get right back on the throne, to jump right back on the throne of my life. Anybody have any examples or maybe explanation as to why you think it's so hard for us to really answer this question? Ross? Well, I was thinking about the story where Jesus explained um, two kings go to war against each other, one with overwhelming numbers. And the other one, the only really acceptable um, action is to ask for terms of surrender. And that's what we need to do every day, surrender to the king because of our sinful nature that we all inherited from Adam and Eve. Amen. Surrender would be the key. Yeah, absolutely. As a military guy, you don't like to think of terms of surrender. No. No, not at all. Spiritually, it's, it's the only answer. Yeah. Amen. I think one of the things that makes it hard for us is we forget that we're still living in a very, very fallen world. Um, and so we get disappointed over things that probably shouldn't disappoint us. Because the, the whole point of disappointment is to be caught by surprise, right? This happened, but I really thought that was going to happen. At the very least, we probably, when bad things happen, more often should say, well, sounds about right. Sounds about Now, that's going to hurt a lot. That's, that doesn't take the pain away. But adding disappointment on top of it, because we expected God to maybe keep all that out of our life, well, that's, that's just to make it worse. And it's to make it harder for us to get off the throne and let God have, have control. Somebody want to read Jeremiah 17, verse 9. Just one verse. Not what we usually think of as a Christmas verse, but I think it is. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. All right. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? Now, why is that a Christmas verse? What does that have to do with Christmas? The whole point of why Jesus came. To appreciate the Savior, you need to understand that you need salvation. Amen. Amen. To appreciate a Savior, we have to realize that we need, that we need to be saved. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's why I say, be fair with Herod for a minute. It's alarming when you show up and ask, where's the king? Um, but let, let us not at all pretend that we don't have a deceitful heart inside of each and every one of us. Because um, we do. We all... I mean, if 
so I used to have a boss a couple of assignments ago who would start every prayer out by saying, Lord, in some way I have not loved my neighbor as I should. And I think he really meant it. I don't think it was rote just saying it over and over. I think he really meant it. Um, in some way I haven't, I haven't really loved my neighbor as I should. I think if we're honest, the reason that is, is I really would rather my neighbor love me. I, I would much rather they be in orbit around me than me serve and love them. Ross? What's the version that you read Jeremiah about? Uh, I have the New Living Translation. NLT. NLT. Yep, NLT. All right, um, virgin birth. Let's talk about the virgin birth. Anything else about the wise men before we move on? That, that's a good point. The whole point of the, what, like the, when, the, when the wise men came, they didn't bring gifts to each other or even to Mary and Joseph. Or to Herod. Or to Herod. Or to Herod. Yeah, they came and they gave them to, uh, directly to God, directly to Jesus. I have a friend who has a theory, and he's quick to say it's just a theory, but these gifts from the, from the wise men probably helped finance their flight to Egypt. Because that's where they had to go right after the wise men left. And it's got to be expensive. I mean, you're on the road for a while. And so that's his theory. That it, the gold, at least, helped finance the, uh, the trip down to Egypt. Of course, we'll never know. But um, it's not, not, a bad, not a bad theory. One day. one day. Yeah, one day we'll know. That's true. One day. One day we'll know. Yep. All right. The virgin birth. Why should we care that Jesus was born of a virgin? Why does that matter? Well, it's just another aspect of, about Jesus that makes him totally unique. So totally unique? No other uh, religious leader claims that. Absolutely. Did I say Jeff? No, I think because it was prophesied. He said because it's prophesied. So... For the sake of time, I'll re I'm, I'm here. I'm in Matthew chapter 1. Um, let's see here. I'll start in verse 21. She will bear a son, and you shall call him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. So one good explanation is because the Bible said it was going to happen that way. And that, absolutely. And that's a more powerful explanation than we may realize. Let's get back to that. I think I saw a hand over here. Mike? I was just going to say, other than it was prophesied and that's the way God said it was going to be, it doesn't make a huge difference how Jesus came into the world. He could have parachuted in as far as... Uh, if God says he's my son and he's the one that you have to be saved by, it doesn't matter how he does it. Amen. Amen. Other than the fact the Bible said it was going to happen this way. So I just read from, well, I read from Matthew, which was quoting Isaiah, which was written around the 700s BC-ish. So a good 700 years before Jesus was born. So we're talking three times the length of how long we've been a country, to kind of put it in perspective. Three times the length of our country. That's how early this was written. And we could have picked other ones, of course, that go back further. One of my favorite Christmas verses is in Isaiah uh, chapter 9 where it says, the people who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. Boy, for me, that's Christmas. That, that is Christmas. Because um, we all have stories, and each of us has spent a lot of time in the dark. Um, and we have a tendency to drift back there if we're not careful. Um, but that verse just, for me, just illuminates the whole point of Christmas. Those who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. Now, why does this prophecy matter? Why the virgin birth? Let's talk a little bit more about this. Why does that matter? Yes, sir? He's the son of God. That takes care of the whole thing. Because he's the son of God. And so if we're going to be, let's be theological here for a minute. So 
all of us inherited Adam's sin. Now, the mechanics of how that worked out, we don't really know. But Paul is very clear about that in Romans, that we all have inherited Adam's <coughs> sin. But Jesus wasn't born of Adam. He wasn't born of a regular union between a man and a woman. So he came into the world uniquely different and, from the very get-go, uniquely not sinful. Perfect from the very beginning. I think theologically, I think, I think that matters. What else? What are some reasons why this prophecy matters? And not just the virgin birth, but just the fact that he was going to be born. And he was predicted a long time before he showed up, hundreds of years later. <clears throat> why should we care about prophecy? Yes, ma'am. Because it shows that God's word is true and will come, will come true. Yeah, I, I think let's start to kind of wrap it up on that because that should probably bring us more, I'll just speak for myself. Christmas should probably bring me more peace than it actually does. And the times that it doesn't are when I forget that it's just because it hasn't happened yet in my life or I still have problems doesn't mean it's not going to be fixed in the future. Confusing those two can rob us of a whole lot of peace and joy. A whole lot of peace and joy. Um, one of the things that I think the virgin birth proves, I'll, I'll say at least two, because one of the accusations people put on the Christian narrative is, well, Jesus just kind of orchestrated the, the way he was going to be killed. Like he lived his life in a certain way or maybe manipulated events so that way he would be crucified as, as was predicted. Okay, maybe. Let's say we buy that for a second. How would he manipulate the events and the details of his birth? You well, you can if you're God. And I, I think that part matters here. That the way he was going to be born so, was predicted long in advance. And I would agree that Jesus manipulated those details, but he did it from heaven as God. But if he wasn't God, you can't. Exactly. And that's, that's my point. And those who would say Jesus is not God, when we point to the crucifixion as one of the you know, the prophecies that was fulfilled, they would say, well, he just kind of orchestrated it so that way it would look like. Okay, maybe, maybe. But then you still got to deal with the whole virgin birth thing. You got to deal with that. And the, the other 350 scriptures that were fulfilled by Jesus. And the other 350 scriptures that were fulfilled by Jesus. So sticking on, on that thing, that point, I think one of the things that this fulfilled prophecy tells us is that God does have a plan and his plan is unfolding the way he wants it to. Exactly the way he wants it to unfold. I need to be reminded of that fairly often because I can get impatient, I can get disappointed, and that, that always sort of fractures my relationship with God. Were you here when uh, Wissam, he was uh, raised in a years ago, and he said the three things that, that can help you persuade a Muslim that Jesus is very, very special compared to Muhammad is that all, all the prophecies that, that were fulfilled by him, he did public miracles and his resurrection from the dead. Hmm. Those things are unique apart from any other religious leader. Public miracles, prophecy, prophecy and re was resurrected. Okay. Yeah, they would be unique, especially that last part. Yeah. Very unique. Yeah. Yeah, we, um, so I, I think this idea of prophecy being fulfilled is important for us because every time I try to put God on my timetable, I end up disappointed. And, and I think we need to be reminded if, if we insist on continuing to do that, then you'll probably never really feel loved by God. Let me say that again. If I expect God to resolve my problems on my schedule, I'm going to struggle my entire life feeling that God doesn't really love me the way he loves other people. 
But if I remind myself, I'm sitting on my own throne and God's having a hard time getting me off of it. My heart is deceptively wicked, more so than I even realize. And Jesus has a plan. It was written long before I showed up, and he's actually working that plan. That helps remind me that I am loved, and, it, and that brings the peace, that peace of God back into my life. Any other thoughts on this before we wrap it up? About five minutes early, actually. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Amen. There's nothing that man can do to change God's plan. Absolutely. Um, and if we pause for just a minute and we're being objective again, we should ask, why do we even try? But we do. We all have moments where we think, maybe God does want this for me, but I don't, and I want to go this way. Those aren't our better moments, of course. But, um, yeah, it's, it's really futile to even try. Um, one of the bumper stickers that rubs me the wrong way is, Jesus is my co-pilot. Seen, seen that one before? And that, that bothers me because if he's king of the world, if he can orchestrate the events of his birth and his death and everything we've been talking about for the past 45 minutes, why in the world would I not just let him sit in the driver's seat? You don't make someone like that your personal assistant. You fall down and worship him, even as a baby, and give him gifts, and then you let him drive. Now, the problem is I have a deceptive heart, and so I have to keep reminding myself, Jesus, you need to be in that seat, and I need to be in this seat. But it's usually one of the indicators, like on my dashboard of my, of my soul, that I, I'm in the wrong seat when I find myself worrying more than normal, panicking when I should be praying. That's the dashboard indicator saying, hey, you're in the wrong seat. You're trying to control things again. You're white knuckle and stuff. So, all right. Final comments, anybody? Ross, would you mind closing us in prayer? Well, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we praise you. Thank you that you love us so much that you made it possible and gave us the option to surrender to you. Thank you for your son. Thank you for his perfect birth, perfect sinless life Merry Christmas.